If you have an atheist that's a friend or in the family, you do not want to miss our interview with Ray Comfort in one hour. The author of God Doesn't Believe in Atheists. Also, we'll talk with Deborah McNaughton, the author of The Get Out of Debt Kit in the 9 o'clock hour. But right now, we haven't spoken to uh, Frank Everhart for a long time. Frank, how many years has it been? Oh, it's been a couple, probably two to three years at two, this point, I think. Two, two to three years. Well, it's good to have you back with us. I you, appreciate you having me back. Frank is a former, well, you were studying to be a Catholic priest. You never went through all the training, did you? Oh, no, that's correct. I had four years of training before I came to know Christ as my Savior. What happened there? What? Uh, why? Now, you were raised in a, a strong Roman Catholic uh, family. Your sister was became a Roman Catholic nun. That's correct. Yeah, you, you could say we were slightly religious. Yeah, okay. And uh, <laughs> went through all the parochial schools, and then I felt that God wanted me to do something for him, and I began looking into different orders of priests and chose uh, the Vincentian order. It's a missionary order of priests. Spent four years training with them, but I had some questions that uh, were, were posed to me uh, specifically by one dear little elderly lady. Mm. And she wanted to know what was going to happen to her husband, how many years he would spend in purgatory so she would know how many masses that uh, she'd have to have the priest say to pray him out of purgatory. Mm. So I started researching for her and trying to find an answer, how many masses it would take and how much forgiveness he would need. And in, in the course of that study and looking, I had exhausted what the church said about purgatory, because there's no formula for a release from purgatory. Mm -hmm. there, there's no uh, scale that says one mass forgives X amount of sins. And so uh, I was intrigued by this, because Catholicism is the only uh, system that claims to be Christian that teaches uh, a place you go after death in between heaven and hell. Sounds a lot like uh, some of the other religions. For instance, Mormonism has uh, uh, different degrees of heaven that you would attain to. Even the ancient Egyptians had this uh, river Styx you would have to cross and, and time you would have to spend before you'd reach your eternal reward. So uh, I, I began researching it and looking into it, and I finally got to the scriptures. That was my last resource to look into. And for a year and a half, I, I studied the scripture under uh, the tutelage of our, our chief theologian in the seminary, and I had so many questions that he, he finally got tired of trying to answer them. And every time I come to him, he'd just give me another few books to read. Mm. It came to the point where I said, look, Catholicism is moving in one direction, and the Scripture is moving in the other. I have to make a choice. Which am I going to follow for the rest of my life? And uh, it was February 4th, 1972, I finally chose to accept Christ as my Savior and follow Him for the rest of my life instead of a system that uh, teaches something of the Bible, but also then holds to traditions and the teaching of the Church Fathers, which actually supersedes the teaching of Christ. Wow. You'll be interested in knowing, uh, this morning, uh, Al, when we signed on, asked me where I got that, uh, that question um, that I ask often of my Roman Catholic friends, how many masses does it take to get out of purgatory and into heaven? And I was trying to think of where I saw it, and then I realized it was on that video that uh, you were involved in, and that is the question that I asked Irma Bombeck uh, ah. a while back. We we talked with Irma Bombeck for about ten minutes, and I had asked her uh, if she had the assurance of of salvation. She said, "Well, I'm a I'm a Roman Catholic." I said, "Well, I don't know a whole lot about Roman Catholicism, but could you could you tell me how many masses does it take to get a person out of purgatory and into heaven?" There you go. And uh, she didn't know the answer, and I said, "I don't think anybody knows." But the Bible, the Scriptures tell us we can be assured of our salvation. Amen. So, absolutely. So you never know the influence you're going. I have. I thought it was interesting. What? No, it's interesting. You were you noticed that the the scriptures were going one direction. Your faith was going another direction. Yeah. And yet, I get a lot of material. I I'm a subscriber to this rock, and there are a lot of arguments uh, that uh, that blast sola scriptura. That so, if you were a good Catholic, uh, wouldn't you have worked around that uh, that little dilemma? See that that's a problem uh, that Catholicism has. It's people are generally very devout, most of them very sincere, and they think that the church is built on the scripture because it says so. But uh, let me just give you a, a quote from the, one of the newest catechisms, the 1994 catechism, which is still the most exhaustive in print to this point. And it comes out and it says that the church does not derive its certainty from the sacred scriptures alone, but tra sacred tradition and the magisterium 
must be reverenced with equal weight. So uh, what they're basically saying is we have three sources of truth. Now, if you look in all the scripture, what does Jesus say? He says, thy word is truth, and that's how God will sanctify his people through his word. My dilemma was, was very similar to what's going on with Catholic people today. Uh, give you an idea. Uh, you've heard, and, and uh, it, uh, it's probably filtered down to uh, your part of the country there, uh, of all the scandals going on in the Catholic Church today with pedophile priests and so forth. Mm -hmm. If Catholicism was based solely on Scripture, that condition would not exist. Give you an example why. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and he did it in six days, and on the seventh day he rested, and God looked and said everything was good. Well, he also looked down at man that he created, Adam, and he said it is not good that man should live alone. Mm -hmm. So he created for Adam his wife, Eve, mm -hmm. and uh, he gave them certain promises. Until this day, we know that the, uh, God still sanctifies marriage. Mm -hmm. So now, what does Catholicism do? It comes out and it says, well, it's our tradition that priests remain unmarried. Well, what does that condition cause? What does it foster? What, what are the problems with it? Well, when you look in the book of Romans and, and the book of First Timothy, where it says that uh, when you do not listen to the Holy Spirit, one of the, the signs of this will be that you will be forced not to marry. Mm -hmm. First Timothy chapter 4 and verse 3. Mm -hmm. Well, who then tells you not to marry? It says this is literally uh, not from the Holy Spirit, but this is a sign from the devil. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not saying that all Catholicism and, and Catholic people are from the devil, but what I'm saying is when you don't follow Scripture... You don't follow the Lord. Mm -hmm. Well, there's only one other authority that you can listen to if you're not listening to Jesus Christ. You're listening to Antichrist. You're doing what is opposite of what God says. Frank, what about our Catholic... And we have a number of Roman Catholic listeners who uh, uh, are still... They, they, they say they're born-again Christians, but they still attend the Roman Catholic Church. They say, I don't believe, I don't pray to Mary, I don't do all that stuff. Uh, but but I, I still like to go to the church, and I don't know if it's because of fear. They've been told that if you leave the Roman Catholic Church, you're damned forever, or what. But uh, what would you say to them? Well, you have to look at it in, in light of Scripture and then historical context. For instance, the Scripture says, Come out from among them and be separate. If you're truly born again, mm -hmm. and you have a problem with praying to Mary, if you have a problem... Uh, with uh, the authority of the Pope instead of listening to Jesus, well, then you're, you're listening to what the Scripture says. So if you don't come out, then the, the situation is you get corrupted. Uh, you go into apostasy and the false teaching, and eventually you'll yourself become a heretic. And historically, that's the context that we see. For instance, most of the great reformers came out of Roman Catholicism. If you look at, uh, just we'll pick one, is, is Martin Luther. He tried to translate the scripture into the common language for the people, and the Catholic Church had a cow. They didn't want it. They didn't want their people to, to have the Word of God in front of them, because then they would see the difference between what God says and what the Church was teaching at the day. And uh, yet Martin Luther was excommunicated. Uh, he, he was uh, hunted by Catholicism. And the very reason is he wanted to teach what God said, God alone, mm -hmm. not what man says. And so my advice for these folks would be very similar. Take a look at yourself and see if you can live in a system that doesn't teach what God says. And if the Holy Spirit says you're born again, you're truly saved, you've got to come out of any system that is anti-Christ. Now, I had a friend of mine in Southern California named Ruth, who was a businesswoman, a prominent businesswoman in L.A. Mm -hmm. And she was Jewish, and she had uh, received Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, as her personal Savior, but she wouldn't dare tell anybody, oh. because it would be bad for business. So she uh, had fellowship with me, oh. and a few Christian friends, but didn't tell anybody. Now, I would think that in the Catholic Church, you've got the same thing. You've got people who, would, who have uh, received Christ, they would love to leave that system once and for all, but their families, their their uh, business associates would put them through hell on earth. Oh, most certainly. Uh, in fact, I have a friend uh, who attended Bible college, and uh, he came to know Christ as his Savior and uh, had to do everything on his own. His family disowned him. And it wasn't until he had uh, two and three children 
that the family started to uh, reconnect with them through the grandchildren now. But for years, it was seven or eight years, the parents refused to speak to him because he had left, in their eyes, the one true church. And so instead of the church just communicating, it was basically his family that said, we'll have nothing to do with you as long as you're following this foreign religion, and that's the way that, uh, that it's looked at. And so, yes, you do have some, some real strange situations between the, the uh, church and families, uh, but you also have a lot of misunderstanding. You see, Catholicism often uses biblical terminology today, but I, I like to say it this way, the dictionary meaning is different. So when a Roman Catholic says they're born again, what do they mean? Well, it could mean that uh, I was baptized, mm -hmm. or that I had a crisis in my life when I cried out to Jesus and mm -hmm. he answered my prayer. Uh, it could mean a number of different things, uh, other than the biblical definition of salvation, which is turning to Christ and Christ alone to be your Savior through his forgiveness of sin. Can you stay with us? We've got five minutes of news coming up next, and I know there are some of our listeners who would love to uh, be a part of this discussion. Would you do that? Oh, certainly. Okay, in the minute we have remaining, tell us about some of the tracks that you have in your um, ministry. Uh, well, we have some general tracks to begin with. Uh, for instance, why must one be born again? But they also have about uh, 35 different types of tracks geared to Roman Catholic folks the way we thought, the way we understand things, to make the issues clear. Tracks concerning Mary and different doctrines and the Mass, so that people can see what the real issues concerning the biblical truth is. And uh, so we do have a lot of uh, tracks, not only that, but videotapes and audio tapes, uh, books and so forth, that will help folks understand that there's a difference between what the Church says and what the Scripture says. Give us a phone number and a website, if you would. Well, phone number is uh, area code 864 895 -0333. The name of the organization is Gospel Outreach International to Roman Catholics. And at, at present, we don't have a website. Okay. You could reach us at uh, G-O-I-T-R-C at Juno.com. At Juno.com. G-O-I-T-R-C. T-R-C. All right, hold on, Frank. All right. We'll continue with uh, Frank Eberhardt. If you'd like to be a part of the discussion, we'll take your calls right after the news at 969-6300. We were talking with Frank Eberhardt. He is a, a former uh, uh, Roman Catholic priest. Went to seminary for four years. Right. And uh, was uh, was just about to, uh, to become a priest. He's like, wait a minute, this isn't what the Bible says. And I'm sure they must have given you the sola scriptura saying, hey, you know, the Bible ain't all there is. That's right. They, they most certainly did. Uh, but you, you've got to remember, uh, you have a, a two-edged sword here. Catholicism claims that it is built upon the scripture. Now if it comes out and says, oh, but the scripture is wrong, and only the church can interpret the scripture, as they do say, you've got a real problem. Because if only the church can interpret the scripture, then how does God speak to man? Is it only through the church, or is it through his word as well? Doesn't he speak to our hearts, that we have the light of the Holy Spirit to help us understand God's word, and God's truth? And all that is, is a definite yes. And so, uh, regardless of what the church had told me at the time, uh, I knew that there were certain basic things that were true, that the Word of God is true. And uh, basing myself upon what it said, I knew I had to make a choice. And that's what a lot of folks are coming to today as well. Uh, they're seeing deception, they're seeing corruption allowed in the church and covered up by the church, and they're starting to say, well, there's got to be something better and there absolutely is, there's Jesus Christ. You, you don't put your faith in men and what men can do. You put your faith in, in Jesus Christ because he is our Savior. He died for our sins, and uh, he'll always be truthful to us. All right, I know a number of our Roman Catholic friends would like to get in. The phone number here, 314-969-6300, 969-6300. Let's go to the phones. Hi, your first name, and where are you calling from? Hello. Hello? Yeah, you're on the air with Frank oh, Eberhardt. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Mr. Eberhardt, where is Sola Scriptura taught in the Bible? Sola Scriptura isn't taught in the Bible, but neither are refrigerators. And uh, we do know that we have refrigerators, and we do know that there is Sola Scriptura. For instance, uh, when Jesus Christ is speaking and he's answering the arguments of Satan, he doesn't come out and say, well, rabbinical tradition says. He says, God's Word says. And so he answered every argument every deception that the devil had with truth, God's Word. 
And so well, I agree with you that Sola Scriptura is not a biblical God. doctrine. But if you look in Second Thessalonians 2.15, yes. St. Paul says, Hold fast to the traditions that you have been taught, rather by, rather, uh, by our epistle or by our word. Mm-hmm. And it's very clear that the early apostles believed that sacred tradition was the word of God, just as the Holy Scripture is the word of God. And but what you've God done is you've left the church that holds those sacred traditions for a communion that's outside of the church. I mean, I have no doubt you have a relationship with Jesus, and that's wonderful. But I really think you're confused and you've been deceived. Well, you, you've got a problem here, because when you find out what that word uh, tradition means in, in, in Thessalonians uh, 2.15, it comes in and it says steadfast doctrine is a translation of the word. So when you, when you read tradition there, you've got a misconception of what he's talking about. And when you also realize that the New Testament wasn't completed until about 90 A.D., you've got to also realize that the apostles didn't write every single thing that they said down. They taught and they preached and they shared the Word of God, they opened the Word of God, and they said, now believe what we're telling you. They didn't establish traditions. They were teaching the Word of God and explaining the Word of God. I'll give you a for instance that, that shows you the difference between what uh, you've just quoted what our Lord Jesus Christ himself said. When the, the Lord was talking to the scribes and the Pharisees, uh, he comes out in uh, Mark chapter 6 and, and, uh, or chapter 7, and he says uh, that they have made vain the word of God through their traditions. Now, what did they do that was different than the apostles did? What the, the scribes and Pharisees did was very simple. They took the word of God, and they said, now how are we going to get this across to the people? And then they developed a series of traditions that the people could follow to help them understand God's Word. Well, the, the problem was the traditions weren't often based upon God's Word. They were based upon man's idea instead. I'll give you just one simple uh, idea of this, was that uh, the Lord says that on the Sabbath day you do no work. Uh, so what the, the uh, Pharisees said is, well, it would be work to walk more than a half mile away from your house. Now, if you read God's Word, you don't read anywhere where God says it's work for you to walk more than a half mile away from your house. But what they said was this was God's intent. Man interpreted what he thought God meant, and then man laid a tradition down. But you know the problem with traditions were that they can always be broken. I'll give you an example how they did this. So well, they, okay, can I respond, sir? No, well, yeah, go ahead. Let, me, let me finish here. Okay, uh, go ahead. Uh, so what they did with this tradition that they set up to teach the people through was they took their servant and they said, here, fill a bucket uh, with dirt from my house grounds here and walk a half mile, and then take a handful of that dirt and put it down on the ground. Then walk another half mile, take another handful of that dirt and put it down on the ground so that the Pharisees could walk a half mile, look and see, oh, I'm still on my property, I haven't walked my half mile from the house yet, here is my dirt, and they walked another half mile. Whenever you have a tradition to try and teach the Word of God, what did Jesus say? You made God's Word vain. So the apostles weren't establishing traditions. They said, obey what you have heard in Word. Well, what's that Word? The teaching of God's Word. It wasn't establishing of new traditions. Well, I agree with you. It wasn't establishing new tradition. But what the biblical text says is that there was sacred tradition passed on by Christ to the apostles that is on par with the epistles. He's saying whether it's taught to you by our epistle or by our word, our written word, or the oral tradition that has come down to you. But I also, you know, uh, 1 Timothy 3.15 says the church is the pillar and the bulwark of the truth. And that statement is never made in Scripture about the Holy Bible. The Holy Bible is God's written word to man. I mean, I have no doubt about that. But there needs to be an interpreter of Scripture. And we see what happens when, you know, the individual tries to do that. That's how come there are 20,000 or more Protestant bodies. And, yeah, I, I believe fully that these people are asking the Holy Spirit to enlighten them. But if, if that's the way it operates, the Holy Spirit's lying to a lot of people. And we know that he can't lie. Well, let me ask you. It's an erroneous way of doing it. Let me ask you. I'm sorry. Your first name. I missed your first name. Tony. Tony. I me Stan. Okay. Okay. Uh, Tony. Um, uh, let me ask you a question we asked earlier. How many masses does it take to get a person out of purgatory and into heaven? 
Um, there is no answer to that. I mean, the Mass is a way of praying for the soul of the, of the faithful departed. You're trying to quantify it to basically, I understand why, ask a loaded question that I can't, think, can't answer. But the answer really is it would take none. See, the Bible teaches to be to, the Bible teaches to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Paul said, "I'd rather uh, go to heaven, but uh, I can do more for you if I stay here." Well, Paul was one of the greatest Christians there ever was. If 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 praying to the saints was important, then with boy, let's let's send Paul off to heaven where he can do a lot of praying for us. He says, "I can I can do more for you if I stay here." Sure, he said he would uh, rather be with the Lord than than to remain here. Mm -hmm. Uh, he didn't. It didn't say to be absent from the body to be present with the Lord. Some people are absent from the body and present in hell. Are they not? Unsaved people, but yeah, that, yeah. that, pa that right. passage yeah. is yeah. talking yeah. about. Yeah. Yeah. That's not a proof text. For but purgatory. there's no. There's. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's no evidence of purgatory anywhere in the word. Let's go on to the next caller. Hi, your first name and where are you calling from? Uh, my name's Craig. I'm in my car. Okay, right, Craig. Craig. Uh, I just Tony had made a lot of the points that I that I was going to bring up. Uh, I'm Catholic also. The one thing that, that always gets me, though, with um, what I say Protestantism outside of Lutheran, is that there's a whole lot that Luther taught that Protestants just simply ignore. Um, it, he had a, a big devotion to Mary. He, you know, he was a Catholic monk. Yes, he had a big problem with the church and, and the the whole idea of the <clears throat> purgatory and and what have you, but but what Luther taught, you know, they still hold the three of the sacraments, the Lord's Supper, Confession, and uh, I forget the third one they do, but they do, it, it's a sacramental church, just as is the Roman Catholic Church, and all, and 99% of that is ignored by Protestants today, and but they always use Luther to argue against Catholicism, but then they don't follow what Luther taught about the Bible. Well, you, you've got to remember further what Luther taught, too, about the, the Scripture. Uh, Luther was, was one of the first to help translate the Scripture into his own language, uh, which meant he was a, a linguistic scholar, and he started the, the... well, he helped begin the Reformation. But you also have to remember that one of Luther's strong points was teaching from the Book of Romans. And uh, in the Book of Romans, uh, we're told how faith comes. Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Faith didn't come through his prayers to Mary, and faith didn't come through his prayers of the rosary, and faith didn't come to his devotion to the Holy Fathers. Uh, the scripture tells us how a person has faith, and, and if you... Well, I, I believe Luther faith, taught that faith came through the word of God. Faith. No, it came through the word of God and through his baptism. That was, and, and that, that was that's the other sacrament they have is baptism, where they will baptize anybody, because they don't believe as Catholics that is anything of our doing. It is God's work. And yet, the, the overwhelming majority in Protestant churches today is that baptism is just symbolic. It doesn't really mean anything. Well, and the that, that does teach so far from what Luther taught and what has been taught in Christianity for 2,000 years now. Well, part of the problem is when you, when you again, read the book of Romans, and, and even read the commentary that Luther had, he understood, according to Romans chapter 6, that baptism is a figure. It's a figure of, a picture of, what Christ has done for us in forgiveness of sins. As we are buried in the ground, uh, our sins are buried through the symbol of the water. And we are risen with Christ uh, in the resurrection to live with him for all eternity, and coming up out of the water of baptism is that symbol that we have lived, uh, we have been changed into the newness of life, not through the water, but through the the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. Now, nowhere do, are the believers baptized first. That's he right. that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not doesn't say he that is baptized not shall be saved. I love the way Curtis Hudson puts that. He says it's like uh, saying he that gets on a plane in uh, St. Louis and sits down will fly to Orlando. It doesn't say he that uh, 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 gets on the plane and uh, does not sit down. It's the getting on the plane that gets you to Orlando, not the sitting right. down. But any fool knows that if you get on the plane, you ought to sit down. Exactly. So uh, it's just a step of obedience. Now, uh, the Catholic Church teaches that uh, Mary did not die. Is there any historical evidence for that at all? 
Well, uh, in fact, there, there's not. The church will come out and claim several different things. In fact, I do have a book in my library. I, I go after old and rare books, especially in religious vein. And I have a book uh, dating back to 1890. And in this book, it's called The Catholic Church, It's Faith and Martyrs. It comes out and it claims that Mary did die and that she was buried in the city of Ephesus, and there her body remains until today. Now, you're going to ask, well, why is there a discrepancy between what it says in 1890 and what it says today? Well, because the latest doctrine uh, that the Catholic Church has formulated, not through the sacred scripture, but through the magisterium, the teaching body of the Church, and the approval, the stamp of approval uh, of the Pope speaking ex cathedra, what happened in 1950, I believe it was November 4th, 1950, where the Assumption of Mary in the Heaven. And uh, so the Pope made a proclamation, and he said that this is the truth. This is now on even par with the sacred scripture, and we must all obey it. Yet not even a hundred years before that, in 1890, the Catholic Church didn't wholly believe it because this book has in it the approval of Cardinal Spelling from New York and uh, he said this is all inconsistent, or this is all consistent with Catholic doctrine. Has anyone ever found a, a tomb of Mary? Uh, some churches claim different things. For instance, uh, they, the church does claim that they have found the birthplace of Mary, they have a vial of Mary's milk. Uh, some uh, tradition says that yes, they have found her tomb, when others say no. So there is a great controversy, because this is all in a traditional area, a vein that's not uh, consistent with Scripture. Because of that, you have lots of variations on, on the person of Mary and many other things. All right, we need to run, but uh, Frank, if people want more information, you've got some excellent tracks. And you don't even need to hand them to your Catholic friends. If you're real embarrassed, you can put them in books that you know they'll be reading or near uh, on coffee tables. Good, good uh, place thing to leave in the laundromat. Absolutely. I'll go into uh, libraries, and I'll take Muslim tracks for our Muslim friends. I'll put them in Qurans. You can take the testimony of Frank or his sister and put them in uh, uh, books dealing with Catholicism in, in uh, the library. Uh, this is one way to do it. Uh, Frank, again, the phone number 864-895-0333. And your, uh, your email is what again? It's G-O-I-T-R-C at Juno.com. At Juno.com. And uh, your address is? P.O. Box 905, Taylors, that's T-A-Y-L-O-R-S, South Carolina, and it's 29687. 29687. And there might be some people who say, well, you're a Catholic basher. How do you respond to that? No, no. I, I, I love Catholic folks because I was one. Amen. And I understand there's a lot of confusion out there, and the only answer to that confusion is through searching for through the Word That's of God right. to find out the truth of Jesus Christ, because He's the author and finisher of our faith. When There's anybody else that matters, but That's right. When she offered turtle doves, was that a sin offering? Yes, it was. Thank you, Frank. Frank Eberhardt, God bless you, brother. Thank you, and you too. And be praying for his wife, as your wife has cancer. Uh, lift her up in prayer. What is her name? Uh, Kim. Kim Eberhardt. All right. Thank you, brother. Thank you. God bless, God bless you. you bye bye. Bye bye.